Hi there, it's Dr. Moby Motion. Now, in this tutorial, we're going to be covering the basics of the molecular script, and we're going to be using it to make this cool simulation where particles interact not only with the scene, but they interact with each other as well. And that's only possible with the molecular script. So we're going to dive straight into this tutorial. But if you'd also like my project files, so the exact blend file that I used to make this scene, make sure to support me on Patreon. It's only $3 and you get access to blends, including this one. We're going to open up a new Blender scene. I'm going to enable screencast keys so you can see exactly what I'm doing. And we're going to save our progress so we don't lose it. Now we're going to use this cube as the basis for our room that's going to get filled up with particles. But to help us get the proportions right, we're going to get some help from the camera. So we'll select the camera. We'll press Alt-R and Alt-G. And this resets the rotation and then the location. We're going to grab it in this axis, about 10. Now we rotate it in the X axis by 90 degrees by pressing R, X, and 90. Now if we press 0 on the number pad, we'll see our cube. And we're going to use this really straight level camera to make sure we have a nice scale to our room. I like to scale objects in edit mode because that preserves the scale of the underlying Blender object, and that helps with simulations sometimes. So we'll go into edit mode by pressing tab, and I'll press control space, so this takes up our whole view. And now we press S to scale, until it sits just outside of our view on the top and bottom. Now I'm going to scale it in the x-axis, until it just sits outside of our view here. And I'll use shift to get a really smooth scale there. And there we have the rough shape of our room. The next thing we're going to add is these holes on either side that are going to allow our particles in. So we do this in edit mode with a series of loop cuts. So we press Control R to add loop cuts. And you can see depending on where you move your mouse, it'll add them in different places. We want our first set to go here. We're going to scroll up on the scroll wheel on our mouse and click and now right click. And we'll do the same on the top here, going around in this axis. And now we're going to go into wireframe. We'll go into side view with three. And we're going to select this. And this conveniently selects it on both sides, which we can use to get a nice symmetrical room. We're going to move this inside view. So we press three on the number pad. We grab these and the Z axis and we scale them in the z-axis down slightly, maybe 0 0.8. And these are going to be our windows. At the moment, if we go into solid view, you can see they're still flat. They don't poke out yet. And that's what we'll do next. We'll go into front view, wireframe. And we're going to make these windows by extruding. So we press E to extrude. And that looks a bit odd. We press S so that we're extruding and scaling. And again, this looks a bit odd. But now if you press X, we're extruding, we're scaling, but we're locking that scale to the X axis. And we get exactly what we want. So we'll extrude this about there. It doesn't matter too much. That should look really nice. Now the main problem that's left with our room is that you can't see through the front side there. And we're going to do that by separating this face. We'll go into top view, edit mode, wireframe. We'll select this whole front panel. And we're going to press P to separate, separate selection. Now you can see these are two different objects. And if you go into solid view, you can see that this is separate and you can move it and reveal the room below. So I'm going to press control and space again to see all my panels. And we're going to go into the object properties tab. Make sure this front panel is selected. And we're going to scroll down to visibility. We're going to uncheck show in renders because we don't want it to show later on. And here in viewport display, we're going to change display as to wire. And now we can see through it even in our viewport. So now we've created the basis of our room. We're going to set up the physics properties for these objects. 
We're going to do this by selecting the Physics tab down here, clicking Collision, and we're going to increase the damping. We'll try 0 0.8, and we'll do the exact same for the rest of the room. So Collision, Damping, 0 0.8, and that's our physics properties. And to really finish off this room, we're gonna make the material for it while we're here. We're gonna do this in a shader window. So we drag down a new window here. We go to shader editor. We're gonna call this a grid because we're gonna get a nice grid material like I have here. We're gonna press control space to full screen this window. And we're actually going to delete the principal BSDF. We're going to build this up from scratch. So press Shift A to add a new shader, a diffuse. And again, Shift A, shader, glossy. Shift A, input. I'm looking for Fresnel. And we're going to use the Fresnel node to mix these together to get nice realistic reflections no matter what angle you're looking at. So Fresnel plugs into this factor at the top. These plug into the two shader ports and the shader plugs into the surface. Now glossy, we're gonna leave as white. We can even make it pure white and we'll decrease the roughness, not to zero, maybe 0 0.05. And the diffuse is what we'll use as our material. Now let's make it a light blue, just so we can preview this material as it is now. So we're going to leave full screen. We're going to press Control S to save our file. Make sure you're in cycles as the render engine, not Eevee. Now, if we go into rendered view like this, the front panel is still visible there because even though it is rendering, Blender sees this as a render. So we could either uncheck this, show in viewport, but then it's harder to select it later if we have to. We can keep this checked, but go to Ray Visibility, uncheck everything. And now we can still select it like normal. It's still visible in the viewport, but it lets the light straight through, which is what we want. So we're gonna preview our scene from the camera view. And it looks a bit dim, so I'm gonna increase the brightness. And I like to set the color to pure white and then play with the strength here. So I'll make this 0 0.4, and we can play with this later. Now save our progress. We're gonna go into material preview, because this will help us see what the material is gonna look like, but it's gonna render much faster. And we're gonna open this up slightly to give us more room to play with our nodes. Now the basis of this node setup is gonna be a checker texture which we add with Shift A, Texture, Checker, Texture. Now if you plug this into the color, you'll see a basic checker texture showing up there. And a little detail that I liked in this scene is that the checker exactly lines up with the window because at the moment it's kind of broken up and that looks a bit odd. I want it to be exactly flush with the checkers. The way we're going to change exactly where the texture maps to is with a texture coordinate node. So we press Shift A, input, texture coordinate, and we're gonna add a vector mapping node, which is gonna help us manipulate it so we can stretch it in different directions. Now we're gonna plug generated into this vector and we're gonna plug this vector into this other vector. And again, I'm gonna make this a nice blue because I think that looks quite nice with this scene. I'm gonna leave color one as white and color two, I'll make this kind of material. Just play around until you find something you like. Now, to get these checkers to line up, we just need to play around with these numbers basically. So, scale, you can scale it in different axes and see what effect it has. So you can see scale x changes it in the x-axis. Like if we set this to 0 0.1, it's a very low scale, so it's very big. Uh, and you can see the x-axis runs 
in this direction and so it stretches it out in that direction but we don't want that we'll keep that as one so what we want is to map it in the y-axis if we go into side view with th ooh, we can't see it very clearly we'll look at it from a slight angle so that we can still see it's mapping properly and we're going to change the y scale very slowly and actually if you want to make it bigger you decrease the scale and now you can change the y location we're going to hold shift as we drag this to make it really nice and precise so you can see it's still too big we increase the scale again move the location again and we're very slowly just going to change the scale until it's about right change the location until it fits exactly and we're going to keep repeating that until it does fit exactly and in every dimension so we're going to continue changing this scale now this is a pretty good fit for the y axis we need to repeat the same for the z axis so we're going to decrease this until it looks about right and now we very slowly change the z location this white check isn't taking up the whole height so we need to decrease this very slightly that might be too much but let's have a look and these changes have to be very fine you can see we're very nearly there i wonder if we just change the location slightly no we don't have enough scale we're going to decrease this very very slightly to 0 0.67 and now we change this very, very slightly. Okay, we have to increase it, not decrease. Let's increase it again. And that is very, very close. There's a tiny bit extra at the top, but this is gonna be more than accurate enough for our purposes. Now, if we go to camera view with zero, save, and go into rendered view, and you can see it looks a bit strange, actually. It doesn't look like it lines up, but that's because this panel is reflecting the background. It's a bit too reflective at the moment. And we're going to decrease that slightly by heading over here, making the shader editor full screen. Now we're gonna do this by adding RGB curves between the Fresnel node and the mix shader. So we'll press Shift A, color, RGB curves. And we're gonna use this to change how much of an effect our Fresnel node has. So we press control space to go back into our standard view and we're gonna slowly pull this down. You can see as you pull it down, it all becomes less reflective. So I'm gonna pull it down to about halfway and see what that looks like. It's still a bit too reflective, maybe a third. Let's look at this in full screen. And that looks really nice where it is now. Now we spent a lot of time lining up the checkers with the windows. And the last thing we're gonna do is change the scale in the X axis. And that way you get checkers on the back wall that line up nicely with the corners and they're more of an even shape so they're less elongated and the way i did that is by tweaking this x scale and this x location so very similar to what we did before but with the x-axis this time and with the scene ready we're ready to move on to our particle physics simulation so we'll leave solid view collapse this area and we're going to create a bunch of things now we're going to make three emitters so one is going to come and create particles from the left side of the scene one is going to make particles from the right side and one is going to make the bigger green balls that you can see in this simulation that are already in the scene when it starts and once we've made those emitters we're going to make three spheres each one is going to be a different color and we're going to use those to make the three different colors of the different emitters. We'll start off in wireframe mode, go to front view and we're going to shift A to add a cube. Now let's grab this over here and we'll scale it down until it fits comfortably inside the room. We don't want it to be right on the edge there, we want it a little bit smaller because otherwise you might get some leak and particles leaving your scene and we'll grab it into the corner there now for the right-sided emitter, we're going to leave that for the time being because that's going to be a duplicate of this one once we have set up the physics properties. We're going to press Shift A to add another cube and this time we're going to scale it in the Z axis to make it nice and thin. 
like that. Now, we're gonna scale it, locking the Z axis, so pressing Shift Z, and we're gonna make sure it fits comfortably in our scene. Now we scale it in the X axis, so it takes up a big part of our scene, but not the whole thing. But we don't want it to be too tall either. So this kind of shape is what we're going for. Now we're gonna go off to the side here and make these spheres that I was talking about. So press Shift A, Mesh, add UV sphere. We're gonna grab it over here so it's out of our way. We're gonna duplicate it, and there's that axis, to make three in total. And we're gonna rename these. So this is gonna be red sphere. This is gonna be orange sphere. And this is gonna be green sphere. And we're gonna set a very basic material just for the time being, so that if we look at them in the viewport, we can see the different colors accurately. So I have the green sphere selected. I'm gonna call this material green. And I'll make this a very basic, a light pastel kind of green color about there should look nice. This one is our orange sphere, so I'll give it an orange material. Again, I like kind of light pastel materials these days. So I gave that a nice pastel orange, I'll give this a nice pastel -y, you know, unsaturated kind of red color. More of a pink to be honest, but I think that looks really nice. Now we'll go to camera view with zero. So we're gonna select this emitter and set up the physics properties for the molecular script. We're going to go to the particle tab, click add and name this left emitter. And we're gonna go through systematically each of the settings. I'll talk you through what they do and how we're gonna use them to improve our scene. So we'll go to emission. Now in the original simulation, this one, I have 10,000 particles coming from each side but that'll take a bit too long to simulate for this tutorial. So I'll stick with 3000 for the time being. I want these to start from frame 100 and go on to frame 400. Now lifetime, you want to make sure it has a nice long lifetime. So 10,000, that's gonna be longer than our scene. So that means we don't have to worry about it. They're gonna be alive for the whole time. Now inside the emission settings, there's a source and we'll change it from faces to volume and that makes sure that the particles come from the cube itself not from the edges of it which can look weird and unrealistic now cache we can ignore velocity though we want to give it some velocity in the x-axis because we want the particles to fly out in this direction so from left to right of the screen and if we look at our diagram here this lines up with the x-axis so we're gonna increase the X to five. We can leave rotation, it adds a tiny bit of realism to the scene, but it also makes it more complicated to simulate and it's not gonna make a big difference here, so we're gonna leave that. Now physics, it's very important to go into deflection and size deflect. If you don't do that, your particles will interact with each other very realistically, but when they get to the edge of the room and they interact with a different object, so a solid collision object, like our room is in this scene, it's gonna go through it. But if you take size deflect, it's gonna interact realistically with the scene. Now, we've started making particles at frame 100, so we'll go into our simulation there. And the particles look really big, but actually the size is only 0.05. This isn't actually how big they are. And it's hard to tell because this render as is set to halo. So if we set this to object and pick our orange sphere object, you get a much more realistic idea of their size. And if you want to change their size, you do that inside this render tab. So I'm gonna make them slightly bigger, 0.07. And it's worth noting that making them a little bit bigger in the scale adds a lot of volume to, to your scene. And that's because the scale looks at the radius or the diameter of the sphere. So it's the length of the sphere that it is across. So let's say you double this scale, the volume in your scene actually goes up eight times. So you wanna be really careful making these changes to the scale. You wanna make them in really small increments at a time. We can leave scale randomness, even though we're gonna use it in a sec. We're also going to uncheck show emitter, which means that in the render, we're not gonna see this box because we don't need to. 
Now we're ready to install the molecular script and set up our molecular physics settings for our scene. We're going to save our scene so we don't lose any progress. You're going to head to the description. Below the Patreon link, I'm going to have a link to a GitHub repository where someone has made the molecular script compatible with Blender 2.8. Now, a few different people have done that actually, but I really like this version because it makes some improvements to the user interface. It makes it easier to navigate the molecular script. So head over to that link, download the version that's appropriate to your system, and then install it like you would any add-on in Blender. Go to Edit, Preferences, Install here. Once you've installed it by clicking here, it'll show up and make sure it's ticked, which means it's enabled for your scene. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to scroll down and see the molecular script here, and you can tick it here to enable it. Now, the two main sections that we're going to use are simulate. This lets us start and stop the simulation and collision. And we can ignore the rest for the most part. So I'm going to make sure the end frame is still 500. We can leave sub steps. We can leave CPU. We can leave all the rest. But now in collision, we're going to activate both of these. So we're going to activate self collision. This means that particles made by this cube are going to interact with each other. And we're also going to activate collision with others. And this makes sure that the other emitters, so the big green balls and the emitter on the right side of the screen, all of those particles are going to interact with each other in a realistic way. And we can leave this collide only with you. You don't want to touch that, but we will increase the damping because otherwise they bounce around a bit too much. So 0.3 should work well. Now the settings are all there for this emitter. We're going to go to uh, orthographic front view by pressing one. We're going to center on our scene and we're going to duplicate it on the X axis. So it sits just there, but we can't leave it there. There's a few changes we have to make. If we scroll all the way to the top, you can see this is still left emitter. So actually the settings are linked and we don't want that. We want this to be a new emitter that's based off of the left emitter. So we're going to press here to duplicate it. And now it's its own object and it has its own particle system. So we'll change the name to right emitter. And we're going to change the frame uh, start and end times slightly. So I want this to start and end a little bit earlier. And you can see the settings haven't changed for the other one. And that's how you know they're two separate systems. We're also going to change the velocity. We want it to go in the opposite direction. So instead of having a velocity of plus five, we want it to have a velocity of minus five in the X axis. And we can leave the rest. And here under the render object, we're going to change it from orange sphere to red sphere. And we want to make sure that these are checked, which they are. So there's no need to change that. You can see the molecular script is already added in. The last thing we need to add is the molecular settings for this emitter in the middle. So let's add a particle system. We'll call this green emitter. We only wanted to make, let's say five particles, but we want them all to appear on the first frame. So we make the start and the end frame one. Now you can see they're all there from frame one. Again, let's make sure they have a nice long lifetime so they don't die unexpectedly. And again, we'll set the source to volume. Now they're a little bit small. I want them bigger like they were in this scene. And I want some nice variation in the size. And we're going to do that by scrolling down to render. We're going to increase the scale to, let's say, 0 0.5. Oh, and again, we don't see the change in scale because we haven't set the object. So let's set it now to object green sphere. I'm going to go to camera view to get a better idea of what they'll look like in the final let render. They look a little bit too small. This is the kind of size that I want, but actually when you add randomness, that's going to reduce the size a little bit. So I'm going to make them a bit bigger than they have to be. So I'll get to 0 0.6. And now we can start increasing the randomness. So I'm going to drag this up. So I have some nice variation between the different sizes. And that's great. And you can see there's no overlap between the spheres. Now I was quite lucky this time. Usually there is some overlap. And if there is, you don't want your particles to explode in the beginning. So you can just play around with the seed. So you can keep going through this until you find a configuration that doesn't overlap to begin with. 
So now these balls look like we want them to and the sizes are right. We can preview what it's going to look like from the camera view. I like the layout as they are now, so we're going to enable the molecular script for them. I'm going to scroll down, tick molecular, and we're going to look at the same settings we looked at before. So start frame, end frame are all correct. And we're going to enable self-collision and collision with others. And again, we're going to set damping to 0 0.2 and collide with 1. We're going to keep that. Now simulations are all about trial and error. So it's all about running the simulation, seeing what it looks like. Oh, this looks a bit off, changing it and iterating over and over again. And when you have a process that you iterate on like that, speeding up each step a little bit can speed up your whole process a lot. We're going to set a keyboard shortcut to starting the simulation. We're going to right click, assign shortcut. I'm going to press control M for control molecular. Now that might have overwritten some important blender shortcut. Let me know in the comments if that's true, but I like it for this case and it's going to work really well for us, but you can set whichever keyboard shortcuts you like. And now we can just press control M and our entire scene starts simulating. Now this looks a bit odd. I'm going to go to front view. You can see the big spheres are falling through and that's because I forgot to tick deflection inside the physics properties and this will let you see the exact effect it has. So if I enable size deflect, you can see now they sit inside the cube. So we're going to press escape. That's going to stop the simulation and we can run it again. So now that the properties are correct for the balls, we're going to press our shortcut. For me, that's control M. The reason that didn't work is because we didn't free the bake. So we need to scroll down here, free all bakes. Now we can press control M again and the simulation runs again. So we're looking for the collisions. You can see they're much more realistic. The balls are sitting on the floor. They're not going through the floor. In a second, the emitters are going to start creating their objects. And we're going to look for the interaction between these small spheres and the big spheres. And you see it's good. These different systems are interacting with each other. But these big spheres look a bit uh, light and a bit too flimsy. So again, I'm going to press escape to stop the simulation. And we're going to fix that. So we select the middle emitter and we want these balls to be heavier. So we're going to scroll up to physics. You can see it's grayed out because we need to free the bake. So down here, we're going to free all bakes. And here we're going to tick multiply mass with size. And now the bigger the ball gets, the heavier it's going to be. And that's how real life objects behave. So I found this tends to increase the mass anyway for this kind of sized object. So let's press control M and see if that helps the interaction be a bit more realistic. And while that runs, I'll just talk about a few quirks of this system. If you look at the end frame of your simulation, it looks like it's jumped up to 2,500, but that's not the case actually. It's still 500 like it was before, but it's all to do with these subframes. So we had 500 frames and between each frame and the frame after it, we've inserted four subframes. So each frame is now five frames. So the original 500 frames are now 2,500. Now this makes it a bit confusing to tell where you are in the simulation. So it looks like we're on frame 700 if you look here or here, but actually it's frame 700 out of 2,500. So we're now nearly at 1,000 frames. When we get to 1,000 frames, we're actually going to be at 1,000 divided by 5. A more intuitive way to tell exactly where you are in the simulation is to open this up and you can see this red bar where the current simulation is. And this is the real original timeline. So you can tell we're about halfway through here because we're on 250 out of 500. Those were still a bit too heavy. So I'm going to scroll up. Okay. I'm going to free all bakes first and then I'll scroll up and increase the mass. Now let's set this to 20. And again, let's run the simulation and let's see how they interact this time. Make sure your mouse is over the 3D window, otherwise the shortcut doesn't work. And while that's all simulating, make sure you've hit the like button on this video if you haven't already. 
It really helps the channel out and it helps more people discover my content. If you're enjoying this tutorial and you want more Blender tutorials like it on simulations, animations, materials, make sure you subscribe to the channel and tick the bell notification icon to get notified of all my uploads. Okay, that looks a little bit better. I'm still gonna make the balls heavier. So again, escape to stop the simulation. I'm gonna free all bakes. And let's increase this to 80. Press enter and control M. And let's see how it looks like. And that's looking much nicer. You can see it is pushing the balls, but it's taking some effort to push them. And that's what it would look like in real life because the bigger balls would be so much heavier. Now I've got a question for you. So this is for either Patreon supporters or people who are thinking of supporting on Patreon. When I'm sharing this kind of file, would you prefer to have the full file with the baked physics? Now this would be quite big, maybe 500 megabytes. Or would you rather have the bare bones blender file with all the materials, all the settings all set up, but you have to simulate it yourself and that's a much smaller file size. Leave a comment down below. Would you rather have bare bones files or fully baked files that just take a bit longer to download? I'm really happy with the simulation. I'm gonna let it run and I'll be back in a sec when it's finished. So there's something I really like about the molecular script add-on. If you scroll down here to the simulate section, you can see an estimate of how long is left. So you can see, oh, there's roughly 18, 20 seconds left of this simulation. And that's super useful, especially for really detailed simulations with lots of particles. It's something that the Blender Fluid Simulator doesn't have. Even the new solver doesn't have uh, any way to estimate time remaining. I think that's a big feature that's missing. And it's really nice that it's in the molecular script. So now that's done, let's go to a frame in the middle with a lot of action. Before we go into rendered view, we're going to save our progress because renders can break things sometimes. And now we're going to go into rendered view. And the scene looks really nice actually, but this cube is in the way. Now I'm not sure why my scene looks like this. This emitter shouldn't be showing because I've unchecked show emitter. And even if I tick it, untick it, I tried leaving a rendered view, unticking it, then going back into rendered view, and it still shows, which is weird. I haven't had this problem before. And I don't think you're gonna have this problem because it's so unexpected. I think if you untick show emitter, it should disappear. But if you have the same problem as me, this is how you fix it. We're gonna add a new material to this cube. We're gonna call it transparent and we'll set it to a transparent BSDF. And now you can kind of see it. Oh no, you can't actually, because this color is pure white, but you wanna make sure it's pure white or you might see it a little bit like there, which you don't want either. So set it to pure white and now it's completely gone from the scene and it won't show up. So we can skip forward and our scene interacts nicely without the cube getting in the way. So now there's just a few small tweaks to make before our scene is ready. Now these tweaks affect the rendered view. So to speed up rendering slightly, we're gonna go into this output properties tab and tick render region. Now your computer isn't gonna waste time rendering outside of that region. We're gonna save our progress in case anything breaks and we're gonna add a light to this scene. I like having a big white area light on the top like this. And we're going to add the same thing here. And it gives some nice reflections in the balls as well. You can do this with a area light as in shift a light area, but I prefer doing this with a mesh because I want to see the light as well. If you just have the light and not a mesh, then you can't see it. I don't know where this plane is, okay. It's exactly flat with the camera, which is why I couldn't see it. I'm gonna grab it up in the Z axis. So it sits just below the ceiling. I'm gonna scale it. So it takes up the amount of area that I want. And now I'm gonna scale it in the Y axis as well. That's a nice ratio. That's a nice size. And now in rendered view, we're gonna play with these materials. I'm gonna give it a material called ceiling light. And we'll change the surface to emission. And now you can see the effect that I'm going for. It's a touch too bright maybe. So I'll switch this down to 0 0.5. So somewhere in between maybe 0 0.65. That 
that feels like it'll be a good level of lighting. I'll give that a second to render, but you can see it's already looking really nice and I'm happy with that. So now we're going to set the materials for our balls. We're going to leave rendered view. You can see the faces quite clearly of these balls and we can fix that by setting them as smooth, but we do that from the balls themselves. So we select them, right click shade smooth, and now you can see the balls are smooth. And we're also going to add a displacement texture to give the surface a bit more uh, texture and a bit more detail. And it's gonna make them look much nicer. Because the green spheres are the biggest ones, we'll see the effect most clearly with them. So I've selected the green sphere there. I'm gonna open up a shader window again, shader editor. You can see the material is super basic. It's just a green material. But actually, I really like this, this specific green color as it turned out. But I will add a texture, a noise texture. And we're gonna add these between the shader node and the, uh, the output node. We're gonna press Shift A to add a vector, a displacement. Displacement plugs into displacement. And this noise texture plugs into height. And now let's recenter our frame slightly and go into rendered view and see what this looks like now. You can see the balls have some nice texture to them. It looks a bit too intense at the moment. So I'm gonna scale this down. And if you reduce the scale, it becomes less obvious. And I think that's really great as it is. It's a nice subtle effect. Now the materials I used in the example were much glossier. So I'm gonna reduce the roughness here and then we get a much glossier material, and that's great. And there you can see the detail of that displacement even more clearly, now that it's a glossy material. Now I'm gonna do the same tricks to the other spheres to get the same kind of texture surface on those as well. I'm gonna select these two nodes, Control C, and I'll go to the orange sphere. And now I can just Control V to paste it, and I get the same kind of displacement. And again, I'll reduce the roughness to 0 0.1. And you can see we have nice glossy orange balls. And again, we'll do the same to the red balls. We'll open up some space here. Control V to paste. Plug in the displacement to the displacement and reduce the roughness. Now our scene is very nearly finished. I'm just gonna add two little tricks. I'm gonna add some motion blur to give the balls a better sense of movement. And I'm gonna use compositing to add the new Intel AI denoiser to massively speed up our renders. Let's start with the motion blur. So we'll go to the render properties here and we're just going to tick motion blur. It's that simple. We can keep the default settings as they are. And now we're going to open up a compositing view. So compositor and we're gonna tick use nodes. Now by default, we don't have all the information that we need to enable this AI denoising. So we're going to enable the extra information. Now by default, we don't have all the necessary information to use the denoising, but we can enable it by going to render layers and tick denoising data. And you can see lots of new uh, data opened up in this node. Now we'll use shift A to add filter, denoise, and we'll start plugging these in. So actually we don't want the image going to the image. We want noisy image. And now we want denoising normal to normal, denoising albedo to albedo. And now to show you just how powerful this denoiser is, we're gonna turn down the number of samples to a really low number. So we'll turn it down to just eight. And let's render the scene and see what it looks like. So you can see even with eight samples, because the lighting is so diffuse, the noise is like, it's not too bad already, but let's see how much better it gets with the denoiser. So this is the image with the noise, without the denoiser, it's about to kick in and there, it just all disappeared. And this denoiser is really like, it's great. It keeps these uh, motion blur paths completely perfectly. It doesn't bl blur them. It doesn't blur these textures. I really highly recommend using the denoiser like we just did. And there you have it, the scene is finished. All that you have to do is render an animation now and you'll have this in no time. Even though the denoised image looked good, 
I would still recommend increasing the number of samples if you can for the final thing. That's because even if it was really smooth, when you have a denoised image over multiple frames, the noise changes between frames. And so the denoised image might look like it's flickering. So I would recommend something like 32 at least samples per frame to get a nice smooth animation that doesn't flicker. And there you have it. Just render your animation and you'll have this cool particle simulation in no time. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to check out my Patreon link in the description and I'll have it up there as well. And you can download this full project file so you can see exactly what I did. Like this video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you next time.